Tonight we're going to look at a, a topic called moral relativism. And uh, you might think, well, I never heard of that word or that topic before, but you, I know you have. Because it's always been around. We're just now sort of giving it some of these names to, uh, to go with. But the definition of it, and as far as our country goes, it's something that's growing more and more in our nation. And really over the past 20 years or so, I guess, it has really taken off. But the definition of it is, I determine what is right and wrong. I determine what's right and wrong for me. We're not going to go back 2,000 years to an old book called the Bible to determine what is right and wrong today. Because the issues that they faced 2,000 years ago has nothing to do with people today. And that's where they go with that. Then they say, we're not going to go back even 200 years. 200 years when our country was established and the Constitution was written, they have no idea what was going to be taking place in the year 2024. And the Constitution is out of date. It doesn't fit mankind today. So therefore, I'm going to determine what's right and what's wrong and not going to rely on that Constitution or any other law that our founding fathers may have written. And some will go back maybe even 20 years ago. Again, 20 years ago, things have really changed so much and you can't go with what's, what they said then because look how much the world has changed. Look how much our, our nation has changed. Look how the, uh, how the Internet has changed everything, pretty much how we do things. And therefore, we just got to look at how things are right now and make judgment calls on how we see them right now. Now, does that sound familiar? It sounds familiar because the, 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 the thought is, truth is what I make it. Whatever I want to be true, then that's what I'm going to make it to be. I don't care what was said 2,000 years ago or 200 years ago or 20. We're going to make a decision based on right now. What is true? Well, let's look and see what is true right now, and that's where it's going. And, of course, what's true today may not be true tomorrow. What's true today may not be true 10 years from now or 20 years from now. So we're going to just determine what's true based on what we have right now. So that's going to make it pretty difficult to tell someone, to try to reason with someone that something's wrong that was based 20 years ago or 200 years ago or 2,000 years ago because they're not going to accept it. And that particular thought is really taken off in our nation. And uh, in one recent survey on this moral relativism, Americans, 80%, 80 now of Americans believe that there is no such thing as an absolute right or wrong. You've got to take it and look at it today. Determine if something is absolutely right or wrong. That's 80%. And that's, that's where our nation is going. That's growing more and more. Maybe not so much here in the South, you might say, but, but it, certainly, it certainly is growing in our nation. But then again, it's nothing new. If we go back to the day of Christ in John 18, 34, when Pilate was questioning Christ, and Christ said, no, here's the truth. That's when Pilate said to him, what is truth? Pilate was saying that as well. Where do we find truth? Do we go back so many years? Do we rely on some, some individual? What is truth? Pilate was asking that question. Well, Christ is right there in front of him. There's your truth, Pilate. But he, he ignored that. He didn't want anything to do with the truth that Christ had to say. So he asked the question, just like many ask the question today, of what is truth. So why has it become so prevalent, this moral relativism? Well, one main reason is that the rise of biblical ignorance. People just do not read the Bible anymore. Now, when I talk about reading the Bible, I'm not talking about picking it up and studying it every day for a while and trying to learn something. I'm talking about just people picking it up and reading a verse every once in a while 
and learning something, people are not doing that. What they are doing, they're picking up the phone, and that's what they're on. Or an iPad, or the laptop, or something like that. That's what they're doing, and they're not really concerned with the Bible. You know, don't need it. So when one begins to have Bible ignorance, or biblical ignorance, that's going to say a lot about what they consider to be truth or not truth. So again, they don't uh, go that route. You'd be amazed at how many people cannot tell you the name of an apostle. You'd be amazed. Name an apostle. Name an apostle. Can you tell me the books of the Bible that record, that record the life of Jesus? They don't know. Can you tell me the first book of the Bible? They don't know. The last book, book of the Bible? They don't know. And you think, well, no, it can't be. Oh, it can be, and it is. I have talked with individuals very recently you know, let's, uh, let's look at the book of Genesis. They got a Bible. They can't find Genesis. They got to go to the front of the Bible where all the books are listed. And it's got a page number. Oh, that book. You would think, who would not know that? But people do not know it. We're too busy keeping up everybody else on social media. And we're just not picking up the Bible. People in general are not. And that's why sometimes it's so hard for Christians to, to say, well, why can't a person understand this? This truth is so, it's so easy to understand. But they don't, they're not going with it. Not going that way. Other things that bring this about, and it's, uh, it's called... I think it's misogynistic or misogynistic, misogynistic. It is a prejudice against women. And that's pretty popular right now. You know, why, why are we holding women back? Why are we holding them down? Some people will, you know, we got a woman running for president and there's some that are going to vote for her just because she's a woman. Not based on any issue, just because she's a woman. I'll show, I'll show you, I'm going to promote the women cause. And, and well, a lot of people are looked that way and instead of trying to look at their qualifications, let's just look at the gender. Some do that. That's what's happening in, in this particular uh, moral relativism. Or it may be that some will look at, uh, well, you're just a homophobic. You know, you don't understand. And we got a couple of generations have been raised in this uh, and uh, they have many friends that are of the other, other side, we might say, and they don't agree with it. Even though what the Bible may say, everything's fine. We've got to determine what the truth is today. That's where they go with that. And then racism. You, know, you disagree with somebody, and, and right off the bat, they may call you a racist just because there's disagreement. And that's where this uh, moral relativism is at in our country, and it is, it's, it is in full strength. Full strength is where it is. And the main reason is the people getting away from the scriptures. And again, I determine what's right and what's wrong. Now, for those who maybe lean this way, oh, they know one verse of the Bible. They can't tell you where it is. But they know they can quote it. And that verse is Matthew 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. You try to talk to somebody about something that's going on, don't you judge me. You can't judge me. Judge not you be not judged. If you were to ask them, where's that at in the Bible? They don't care. They're going to use that to their advantage. And again, it's amazing how many people have no knowledge of the Bible but yet they can quote that verse because it's very popular when, you, when, I got to, when I determine what's true or false today, you can't judge me whatsoever. And that's where they're going with it.
But just uh, just quoting it doesn't do, any, do one any good because it's, it's, it's Christ saying right there that we can never make a judgment call on anything. We can't go back and make a judgment call. We've got to determine the, what's going on around us at the moment and make a call that way. Uh, again, what is Christ saying there? So if one only took chapter 7, verse 1, and looked at it that way, then they might come to the conclusion that, that uh, we can't make any judgments. Well, as we're going to see, Christ has given several places in the Scriptures where judgments can be made. And if, and if Christ said certain ones can make judgments, then this verse here, Matthew 7, verse 1, is not saying that nobody can make a judgment. If he said it's okay for some to make it, or under these circumstances to make it, well, then we've got to go back and restudy Matthew 7, 1 and see what Christ is really speaking about. One such place where Christ has given the okay for judgments to be made is in government, civil, civil government. That's in Romans chapter 13. He has given the government the authority to make judgments. This is not saying the government makes the right judgment every time. Not saying that. But certainly God has given the government the authority to make judgments. Are they going to make wrong decisions at time? Yes, they are. They're going, it's going to happen. But God has said, be subject to these governing authorities. As he says, Romans 13, 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except God, and authorities that exist are appointed by God. So every government, whether good or bad, God has, in a sense, ordained it to uh, be a leader of the people. Some governments are better than others. There are some governments I would not want to live under. And uh, even though we have a, a good government, it's not perfect. But still, it's ordained by God. Uh, verse 2, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Uh, do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must make subject, therefore you must be subject, not only because of the wrath, but for also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, and they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. So we are to obey the civil authorities. That's what he's telling us. You get pulled over by someone, say a law enforcement, and you're going 25 miles per hour over the limit, and uh, you, get pull, you get pulled over, he says, uh, you're going 25 over the limit. Why don't you say to him, don't judge me. You can't judge me. Judge not, you be not judged. Give him a verse. How's that going to work? So it doesn't work. God says we are to, we're subject to the governing authorities. And this is something that more and more people are not, not wanting to do when they are pulled over by law enforcement. Uh, they may not roll the window down. They may be talking through the window. They don't want I don't have to show you my license or registration or anything else. And, uh, and the officer says, yes, you do. The law says you do. And eventually it gets out of hand and the, and the glass is broken. The person's dragged out. That's what happens. But it's all because individuals are thinking, I don't have to obey anybody. And the truth is what I have right now. What's around me? I make that decision if I'm right or wrong. If I'm going over, over, over the speed limit, that's my decision. If I want to do it, I can. And of course they're wrong. So God, Christ has said, God has said, uh, the civil authorities can make judgment calls. They can do that. Another that he says is that of the eldership. 
Hebrews 13, 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy, not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So in eldership, they, they lead the congregation. They want the congregation to go well. But one day a trans person comes in. He's a male. But that day he's identifying as a female and he goes into the ladies' bathroom. An elder has the authority to say, no, you don't go in there. You go into the other one if you're going to go. Or don't judge me. Judge not, you be not judged. You can't judge me. Yes, they can. Because in the, in the confines of this uh, assembly, uh, they have, you know, the judgment call here of, what's, of what one is to do and be done in the right way and such. So they make that judgment call. So here, God has ordained or given the, the rule of the eldership to make some judgment calls. What is right and what's wrong, even within the, the confines of the congregation, the confines of the building. About employers, do they have the, the, uh, the ability to make judgment calls? Well, according to Ephesians 6, 5, bond servants, or we might call them employers, uh, um, employees, that is, be obedient to those who you are masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. So do employers have the right to make judgment calls on their employees? An employee is caught stealing. We got him on camera. They're putting money in their pocket. The employer, the boss goes to the individual and says, I'm sorry we've caught you in this act of theft. You're fired. And the employee says, no, you can't judge me. Nope, not judging me. Judge not you, be not judged. Can that person say that? Well, they can say it. But yet, Christ has given employers... Here, or as he says, they're masters, and if you go back to the first century, the terminology there, he has given them the ability to make judgment calls when it comes to who's employed, who's not, who, what you are to wear, you know, your hours, things like that. If you don't want to work there, go somewhere else. But he is, God has given employers to make the judgment call. There's another judgment that is based on Scripture. In uh, Matthew, uh, John 7, if you look ahead, if you go back to chapter 5, Christ has just healed a man on the Sabbath, and there are those who didn't like that. And they were following him around everywhere he would go. <clears throat> and here they come to him, and they begin to question that. And uh, Christ says to them, in verse 24, Do not judge according to your appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. That is, you make sure you got book, chapter, and verse if you're going to make a judgment call from a scriptural standpoint. Like he brings up to them in, in John chapter 7 about, uh, about circumcision, or in this conversation, circumcision, he says, you know what? What if the baby is born in the eighth, and that the eighth day falls on the Sabbath? You have no problem with that child being circumcised on the Sabbath day because it's the eighth day. That's what the law said to do. No, we don't have a problem with that. Why do you have a problem with me healing on the Sabbath then? There's no law against that either. And Christ brought that up to them. So he's showing them here, just as he's showing us, if we're going to make a call on something that something may be wrong, we need to uh, have some scripture, a righteous judgment to back that up. And don't just get out here and say, I think. Try to make that book, chapter, and verse best we can. And maybe we also remember that we are fruit inspectors. You know, we are, what, what we see is what we got to go with. What we hear is what we got to go with. You no, know, we don't know the person's heart. We don't know why it's being done. But there has to be, a, you notice it right off, and there has to be another step or two to go into to find out what's going on. 
But Matthew 7, 16, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Uh, so we can make some judgment calls on some things. You see some bad fruit there, you might want to talk to that person about that bad fruit. Talk to them about it. And do it in the, in the right way. So we go back to Matthew 7, and verses 1 through 6. Uh, he says there in verse 2, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but not consider the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, the plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you to pieces. So the context that Matthew 7, 1 is, is followed. Don't go out here and tell somebody, you need, you need to look at what you're doing. Stop what you're doing if you're doing the same thing. You can't do that. If you're guilty of the very same thing that you're going to them about, don't do it. You are a hypocrite. Verse 5, that's what he calls them. You can't do that. Don't go to them and do such. And Jesus is making that clear. And he also says there in verse 5, if you get that plank out of your eye, straighten yourself up, yeah, then you can go to them. But don't go to them if you're doing the very same thing. That's not going to work. That's not right. You are a hypocrite. And what he says there in verse 6, don't give what is holy to the dogs. They will turn and tear you to pieces. If you are guilty of doing the same thing and you go to them they're going to tear you to pieces well, they're going to say I saw you doing the same thing why are you correcting me for you're just as guilty as I am you were there and I did it you were with me when it, when it happened or on it goes they will tear you to pieces what they'll do don't take what's something that is right a good thing and go and just trample it and where it's of no use at all. You can't do anything. So uh, don't let that happen. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you, you are disqualified. So again, examine yourself. Make sure I know what I'm doing. I get that plank out of my eye. Don't you go. You got it in your eye. Bad judgment is what it's called. And Paul talks about that in Romans 2, 21 through 24. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who adore, adore idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. You say don't steal, but you steal. You say don't commit adultery, but you're committing adultery. Don't you, you say you need to hate these idols, but you're going there and worshiping in the place of these idols. And you boast about keeping the law, but yet you dishonor God by breaking that law. That's what he's coming across here saying uh, to these individuals. Don't do as I <clears throat> don't do as I do, do as I say. That's a little popular phrase we use sometimes. Don't do as I do, but do as I say. And here Paul is condemning them for this. Uh, do not say that the church is important to you. Church services are important, and yet you don't attend yourself. Don't do that. Don't say you should be taking part in church activities if you don't take part in activities yourself. Can't say that. 
Don't say that drunkenness is wrong if you social drink. Don't do that. That's what Paul is condemning right here. To do such is blasphemy. You're just making the law out of nothing. God's law out of nothing. Uh, and then we'll back to Matthew 7 there, 1 through 6. There it is again. Uh, don't take something that's holy and turn it into something that's unholy. Don't, about the, uh, they'll turn and tear it to pieces. So what about this righteous judgment? Uh, here's some good thoughts on that. Know the person's motives. You need to know what, why that person is doing it. You may see something and just don't go off the, the cuff and say this is why they're doing this. You might need to talk to them some. Don't make a rash, rash judgment. We do that too much. Again, get to know that person. Talk to them. Get the facts right. Get all of them as many as you can. Know what's going on. Do what you do in love. You go to that person because you love them. You have a concern for their soul. You go to them in the right way. And think about if, if you were the one that somebody came to you, how would you want to be treated? How would you want them to treat you? You treat them in this way, you know, doing to others as you have them doing to you. Treat them in the right way, with that he says. So that's some parts about righteous judgment. But also there's one judgment that God has not allowed us to make. And that is the final judgment. We cannot make the final judgment. Can't do it. God's going to make that judgment on judgment day. And he's given us plenty of illustrations on that, plenty of parables. You have the parable of the, uh, the ten virgins. You remember who shut the door, what let the ten foolish ones in? The bridegroom did. The, the ones that went in, the, the ten wise ones that went in, they didn't shut the door. What led them? The bridegroom did. Parable of the talents. Who told him good job? Who told him not so good of a job? The master did. The two that did well didn't, didn't condemn the one that only did, did nothing. The master did. Uh, the sheep and the goats. The king did the dividing. All that's in Matthew 25. God's going to do all that. And he'll do it right. We're to teach truth. Well, person, how do we know a person's not saved? We go to the scriptures and there we find what the Bible says one must do to be saved. And all the uh, who, what, when, where, how, all those questions we ask. And if it doesn't fit the scriptures, then, you know, there we got, we're making a judgment call. We're not going to make that final judgment. Here's what the Bible says to do and be good if you did that. Or here's what the Bible says how you should live after you become a Christian. It would be good if you did that. But, uh, God's going to make that final call. I'm glad we don't have to. Because we would probably, uh, we, we would mess it up. We would make some, some decisions that we shouldn't make. We might keep some out that should be in, and let some in that should be out. That's probably what we would do. So, this moral relativism is alive and well in our country. Let's see what the truth is right now. Forget the Bible, forget the Constitution, forget any law that was made any time. What about right now? And that's, that's very dangerous. Any thought on it? Okay, time for the bail. We'll end here.